Hello and good morning. Thanks, Michael. Uh, welcome to the BMJ Learning webinar on preparation for practice. Kieran Walsh is my name. I'm clinical director at BMJ, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Matt Morgan, who's lead editor for BMJ on examination. BMJ on examination is our exam support and assessment service. Matt is also consultant in intensive care at the University Hospital of Wales in Cardiff and also Director of Research and Development in Intensive Care and also Honorary Senior Lecturer in Cardiff University. So preparation for practice. We all remember our first day as a junior doctor. It's a time of stress but also of rapid learning. So how can we as educators reduce the stress and increase the learning? How can we make the transition from student to doctor smoother, safer and better for, for everyone, for learners, educators and for patients? Traditionally, transitions have been seen as a problem. So how can we flip this and see them as an opportunity, an opportunity for learning? There's lots of transitions throughout a, career, throughout a medical career but the big transition has always been and will always be from medical student to doctor. And this is a big, important and international issue. And it's an issue that BMJ is keen to help with through the BMJ Medical School collection. And it's the exact issue that Matt is going to tackle in, in a second. So Matt, over to you. Thank you, Kieran, and a really warm welcome to where I'm sitting right now in a very grand building in London, which in the 19th century was the home of Dickens and in the 20th century is now the home of the British Medical Association, as well as the British Medical Journal Group, which is where we are presenting from now. And I'm delighted to welcome people who have signed up to this webinar from as far afield as Egypt and even Barbados, which will be much brighter than our London day out the window today. The first thing to say is my competing interests. I do work for the British Medical Journal Group, and so uh, that needs to be said at the outset. But I'm very much speaking today as a clinician, as a practicing doctor, and as a person who's gone through this transition period myself in my career. Becoming a doctor was a huge event for me and my family. This was me on graduation day with my parents and my girlfriend who is now my wife. It was a very special day but also a time which was difficult. I was full of anticipation on that day of graduation, but my first year was difficult. I was nervous. I made mistakes. I wasn't prepared for the reality of clinical medicine, not only the practical aspects, but some of the theoretical aspects and interacting with patients. I calculated yesterday that it took around 10,050 hours for me to become a doctor from student to doctor. Around half a million pounds cost to the UK taxpayer. And it's no coincidence that 10,000 hour mark. Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers has shown that 10,000 hours is often the minimum required to become an expert in one area. And so you as medical educationalists and your students are putting in a huge amount of time, effort and money. And we really need to make that come to fruition and focus on the period when they become doctors. Although I had a difficult first year, it was marked at the end of that year by a very memorable patient that made it all worthwhile. I met Ivor on the ward I was working one day. He was an elderly, frail man who was very ill. 
and he asked me a fairly simple question. He had been nil by mouth up until that point and asked whether he could have a drink of water. And I made a decision, probably one of the big decisions in that year, I said yes. And the words he said to me as he drank that glass of water were, thank you doctor, it's like coins falling from heaven. And for me that was a transition phase. I'd moved from a student to a doctor making seemingly small decisions for me, but big decisions for patients. And that's what we want to help you with today. The way we are going to illustrate this is to focus on three aspects of this transition. First, I'm going to talk about the aspects of the hand, the practical aspects about medicine. Secondly, I'm going to focus on the head, issues surrounding knowledge and knowledge transfer. And finally, I'm going to talk about issues of the heart how to deal with the reality when often doing a difficult, complex and emotionally required task. The way I'm going to talk about these three issues is by telling you stories about three real junior doctors, although their names have been changed for confidentiality. First, we're going to talk about Catherine. And this is going to illustrate the issues of the hand. Catherine was a very academic student. She was head girl at her school, always top of the class. She always prioritised study first and did very well as a result. She won a prize on graduating from medicine. Her family were delighted and she was delighted. But on that first day in hospital, Catherine struggled. She found many of the practical aspects of medicine, practical procedures particularly, challenging. Although her medical school had provided simulation, it hadn't provided simulation which dealt with local equipment, what would actually be there on the wards for her to use at the time. Again, they had shown Catherine what to do, but not particularly what to do when she couldn't help, when that procedure was difficult, or when the patient was not tolerating it. Another aspect she struggled with was the bridge between doing a practical procedure, having those test results, and interpreting those test results. And also the fact that there is often a person, a patient, somebody's mum, somebody's dad, attached to the end of that arm that blood is being taken from. So the message here is that simulation is a key part of learning. And through this transition phase, making that simulation suitable for the local environment, suitable for the local equipment, and remembering that actually there's a patient at the end of the arm where blood is being taken from. And that should all be built into the simulation experience for students. This can also be dealt with by using an in-depth shadowing period where students actually perform the tasks, the jobs, using the equipment they will use in reality of a junior doctor. This is also particularly helpful for the legalities and protection in medicine. One aspect Catherine also struggled with was dealing with acute emergencies where there was little time to think and study. This included emergency prescription writing and the practicalities of writing prescriptions for patients to take home. Again, medical schools can focus on these acute emergencies 
even providing regulated advanced life support courses and courses which deal with acute medical emergencies for all students. Practical prescribing simulation in situ is also a key component of this. So that's Catherine's story, dealing pre predominantly with issues of the hand. I'm going to move on now to Tom's story. Tom, unlike Catherine, was academically middle of the range in his class. He didn't struggle at medical school, he didn't excel either. But what he did love was the certainty of science. Indeed, that's why he chose to become a doctor in the first place. His most interested subjects were physiology rather than the medical humanities. And he was fairly strong when answering written tests, especially when he needed to choose the best answer out of five. Tom's first week in medicine was plagued not by the practical aspects like Catherine, but more dealing with the realities of uncertainty. Patients don't present a best of five list that you need to choose a disease from. They come with rich, often complex and contradictory stories. And the process of transition needs to reflect this. Sometimes you won't find an answer. Sometimes you will find the wrong answer. And understanding this is okay and is important. Tom also struggled with the idea of didactic guidelines to follow within the hospital. He tried to marry his scientific knowledge of what's happening with the practical aspects of guidelines telling him what he should do. And again, when medical schools teach this transition through in situ simulation or practical clinical examinations, the issue of guidelines should be covered and how there is often uncertainty in them. Tom also struggled with concepts such as what can be done rather than what should be done. Medical frailty is an increasing issue in today's society. Whilst medical technology is increasing in pace, we need to know what patients want with shared decision-making and effective communication with families. Tom also had some difficulty interpreting practical radiology and ECGs. This is often an aspect taught didactically, but often the implications of how to interpret an x-ray and what to do next are not considered. The final issue that Tom would have really benefited from was an understanding of human factors and cognitive errors which can have implications for medicine. Factors such as anchoring bias, where during a handover, Mr. Jones in bed three has had an acute myocardial infarct. That's all you can focus on. And in fact, he had an aortic dissection which hadn't been considered. That's Tom's story, how he had to deal with issues of the head, human factors, dealing with uncertainty, and dealing with frailty. I'm going to move on now to the final story, Nadia's story, predominantly looking at issues of the heart. Nadia was almost the perfect student she was a really good all-rounder, academically strong, strong in practical procedures and communication. She enjoyed sports, played for the medical school team, and she even found time to do extensive charity work and have a full, active social life. She really enjoyed the process of becoming a doctor, and the first week went very well. 
by week two and week three, Nadia had some difficulties. The enormity of responsibility that she felt was starting to affect her life outside of work as well as inside of work. She would know what to do and how to do it, but she struggled to deal with the responsibility that gave her. For the first time in her life, she had real ownership of what patients were going through. And she made mistakes. But Nadia didn't deal very well with making mistakes. She took it very personally and didn't have time to reflect on those mistakes. Through medical school, acknowledging that mistakes happen and that these are often issues with the system in which we work rather than individual failings is key. Reflection of these is also key as well as dealing with them from a team-based approach and a systematic approach. Nadia also had issues with the treadmill of life. Whilst before she worked extensively on her charity work and her sport, she now had a demanding job with shifts which changed, including night shifts and weekend work, and this took its toll on Nadia. She wished that she'd experienced the realities of that shift work during the transition phase, so she could have made some adjustments to life and outside work before starting on day one. This also had some implications for Nadia's health. And the medical school she was at didn't approach the issues of how to deal with personal health through working. Finally, there are implications for Nadia for finance and life choices. Entering the world of work from being a student comes with baggage of financial implications, insurance, indemnities, housing and others. Key in this transition phase is support when making difficult decisions which may have lifelong implications. Having protection insurance in place early and appropriately through a shadowing period is also key. So that's Nadia's story of issues of the heart. So today I hope that we've illustrated some of the challenges in transition related to the head, the hand and the heart. The good news is recognising these challenges allow you as educators and you as medical providers to put strategies in place to help these three people and to make their transition better for them as doctors, as future educationalists, as leaders, and importantly, for patients. The British Medical Journal is a global group with seven worldwide offices, both here in the UK, Europe, the Americas, Asia. We have over six million people using our resource every, every month. Over 80% of our users say that using our clinical resources has had real impact into their work and the way that they treat patients. And we want to use this reach to help in this difficult transition period, not only for doctors and patients, but for you as education providers. Using our team of experts, we have put together a bespoke package to help with many of these aspects of transition. It goes over practical aspects of interpreting tests, x-rays, ECGs, the common emergencies that you'll see on the reality of the coal face of medicine. It also talks about some of the difficult ethical, moral and legal issues facing people, including child protection, communication skills. 
And finally, it also addresses issues that we know can harm patients. One in 10 patients in hospital will have a prescribing error and we have a particular module directed to safe, effective prescribing for patients. It's hoped that this package, along with changes that you can implement at a medical school education level, will help students in this transition to becoming safe, happy doctors in acting shared decision-making with patients. Thank you all for your time. We now have a period where my colleague, Dr. Walsh, is going to select a number of questions which the panel here can answer directly. We also have a custom email address for this student transition project that you are very welcome to be in contact with. We can provide more information, demos of the resource, as well as discussing the practicalities of instituting this within your institution. Thank you. So thanks, thanks very much, Matt. That's that's great. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, and one question that I had first. We concentrated on um, the big transition from medical student to doctor um, in the UK to foundation program doctor elsewhere to intern or, or whatever. Um, what are the other big transitions in medical careers? Would you say and what? What are the kind of what are the lessons that we need to think about yeah. um, when thinking about those those transitions? Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess there are four other major transition areas which should have some thought and attention. The next one, post qualification, is predominantly a choice of subspecialty career, and this is so important. It will impact on your career, your life, and often it's done in a rather ad hoc way of talking to others in your hospital, experiencing different subspecialties through serendipity rather than through planning. Again, I think probably a more structured approach to this of taster sessions with different subspecialties, having people within medical education tasked for career advice, using resources such as BMJ Careers, podcasts, and looking into the lives of subspecialties would, would be key. There's also a big transition towards the end of subspecialty training, where independent practice plays its part. I've recently become a consultant in the last six months, and Although practically what I do every day is very similar, the decisions I make every day are very similar, it has a different weighting and a different responsibility than pre that period. And also you're now, you're, there are people dependent on you for providing education, leadership and skills. And I think that's a phase that needs to be addressed also. Great, fantastic, thank you. We have a few questions coming through now, and I'll, I'll read the first one out to you. Um, very interesting, thanks. How can medical schools prepare students even better to handle this need to be prepared for things to be different? Uh, robustness, flexibility, etc. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, and what I think we should be doing is, yes, the didactic science and guidelines are essential, but we also should be teaching thinking skills, the importance of cognitive errors, and also things like resilience training is really important. These are aspects of training in many other industries which are key components, but in medicine they are assumed to be present rather than proactively taught. It's never been a better time to provide resources and teaching for things like cognitive errors. There's a wealth of literature out there, a wealth of courses, 
practically and online learning. And what you're really doing is preparing students to be independent learners in the future because knowledge will change. There was a paper published a year ago. If you went to medical school 10 years ago, 60% of knowledge you were given at that time was wrong, is now wrong. And not only is it wrong, on occasions it is dangerously wrong. And so we can't assume that simply providing the knowledge is sufficient. You also need to provide the skills, both practically and cognitively, to continue that learning journey through to retirement, actually. Great, thank you. An another question coming through. Um, hi, doctor is wondering, what's the best approach to take if you find yourself being overwhelmed with the job? especially when it starts taking a toll on your own health. Again, I think medicine has changed in the last decade. It used to be that you simply had to cope, and that led to problems for personal health, patient's health. Nowadays, that's simply not good enough, and not only hospitals, but indeed country systems need to provide support to help people through. I think the key is identifying what it is you're struggling with. Is it that you're in the wrong subspecialty? Is it that there's issues of team building that needs to be addressed? Are there personal health issues which need to be addressed? Being open and honest about that is key. And what can't happen is that that cycle continues because things without being addressed may get worse. There are helplines available for doctors with health issues both in this country and abroad. There are support organisations, chat groups both online and offline. And key is identifying a mentor either within your specialty or not where these issues can be discussed and dealt with. Now, our hope is providing these tools for transition will stop people getting to that point in the first place. Great, thank you. I guess the tools are just one component that they need to be fitted together with what the institution might do and what the what mentoring programme might offer and all these different things. Yeah. Great, thanks, thanks, Matt. Um, another question: um, how, how might I know that my institution has a problem with transitions, and it's not just a few people complaining? How might I know that there's an institutional problem with with transition from, say, medical student to doctor? Mm. There's probably three approaches to take here. The first and the best approach is something which is less frequently done actually, and that's to gain feedback from students after they've qualified. Medical schools often focus on feedback during the course for student satisfaction uh, and immediately post-graduation, but often what isn't happening is that feedback a year, two years down the line, and I think that that's really key to develop those systems. You could use surrogate metrics such as dropout rates in the first year or subsequent years. And you could also use other metrics such as postgraduate or training pass rates or success as a surrogate measure. But I think key to this is feedback from the students and the institutions to which they go subsequently to identify this issue. And, and how well do you think medical schools in the UK and around the world kind of have this ongoing relationship with their students so that they can kind of follow up with them? If this comes back to the working of healthcare and training and education, certainly in the UK, is a relatively segregated from service delivery through the use of deaneries and trusts. Increasingly, the encouragement is 
education providers, i.e. deaneries, to work hand in glove with healthcare providers for, for mutual benefit. And I think if those relationships aren't there in your institutions, that's something solid that you can achieve in a short time, is going to speak to the institutions, forming those relationships for feedback. And it will be something that very much benefits both parties. Right, thank you. Um, you've kind of started to answer the next question, uh, which is about what transitions tell us about the merits and failings of the current medical education system. And I guess one of the failings is that is that kind of silo working sometimes or lack of continuity. Any other thoughts about kind of merits and failings? I think I think the word failing is probably too strong. Uh, medical education, in many ways, is is hugely successful. We take a student, and in the case of ten thousand hours, we turn them into a a doctor, making complex healthcare decisions, integrating science in actually a relatively short period of time. The key is that's not the end. That's that's the start. Um, what I would say is that any system is perfectly designed to achieve the results it gets. And what is clear is the expectations of patients, families, carers and systems have radically changed in the last 10 years. That in conjunction with sometimes financial pressures in the health system has meant this transition phase more than ever is important. Things that can be done, I think relationships are key between institutions and educational authorities and recognition that times have changed, patients' expectations have changed and therefore a thoughtful redesign of that latter stage of the education process is, is key to producing results which we want. Right, thank you. A, a difficult one that lots of medical students and junior doctors struggle with, I think, is when somebody dies, and particularly when the first person that they've been responsible for, one of their patients, has, has, has died. And, uh, and they often struggle with that, even though, as medical students, they will inevitably have seen people who've, who've, who've died. But this will be the first time that it's, it's kind of, it really is one of theirs. What's the kind of, what's the advice on on that? What's yeah. the latest thinking on that? Matt? Again, I think this comes down to medical schools having a responsibility to tell people and to show people the realities of, of life and medicine. Uncertainty is a daily occurrence. A lack of diagnosis is sometimes a daily occurrence. And certainly in my line of work, intensive care, as many as one in four patients in my intensive care unit will die. But actually, that's a key part of being a doctor, is not only dealing with that yourself, but being support for the family and the team around that. Steve Jobs said that death is life's greatest invention, and I have the ability to almost appreciate life because we are privileged to see the other side. I think, again, simulation, but not just simulation, you know, in-depth simulation through the use of professional actors, through patient advocates, through real patients who have experienced loss is key. But I think overwhelmingly what it needs is an honesty that everything can't be fixed, Life and death go hand in hand, and medicine is full of uncertainty. Thank you. Last, last question, um, unless we get any more through. Um, this one is more UK-based. About the GMC, it's planning to move the time for new doctors for their registration from the end of Foundation Year One due to exit from medical schools to the start of 
Foundation Year One, or at least they're talking about it. I don't know has their kind of plans uh, been 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 realised, or is it is it something they're absolutely going to do? Mm. But can you tell us more about that and what that might mean? This is a really important uh, and fundamental change. Medicine has always been felt to be somewhat an apprenticeship model with knowledge base bolted onto it. And I think in the past, partially because of that registration being at the end of a junior doctor period, it was a process in that first year of that was almost your high intensity apprenticeship. With this move, that can no longer be the case and your students have got to be starting their job with many of the tools prepared to do it, with a lot of the experiential learning already done. Certainly many medical schools in the UK are moving things like final exams much, much earlier in the course to allow six months, 12 months of in-depth shadowing in that last year so that that apprenticeship is brought within the fold of the medical school pre-qualification and actually if done well I think that's a very good thing it allows you to have some more control and oversight and mentorship of that really important period but what's key is that it has to be planned and delivered in a very effective manner. Okay, excellent, great. Thank you very much. And that's all, all the questions, I think, as far as I can see, that have, have come through. So thanks very much, Matt. Really, it's extremely helpful. Um, and before we close things, um, I'm going to hand it back to, to Michael, if that's okay, just so Michael can let us all know whether we're going to make this video available ongoing or some of you might have further questions which you couldn't think in the past, think of in the past 40 minutes, but you might want to send them through to us. And, uh, and if you do, we'd be really interested in, in, in hearing. So if that's okay, Michael, if you can let our uh, audience know how they can continue to communicate with us in the future. And, and lastly, to say that we hope that this is one of a series of webinars that we're going to do for uh, on topics related to medical education, clinical decision support, um, and quality improvement. If there are other topics that you would like us to address, do let us know.